those of you that are here in the classroom and those of you that are online, I look forward to spending the next hour or so with you talking about some issues related to food safety. One of the things that hopefully that you'll go away with this morning is an appreciation for the challenges that we face in the public health community related to food safety and some of the steps that are being taken really from farm to table in order to try to effectively address those kinds of things. One of the things that I will emphasize throughout the morning is that America does have one of the safest food supplies in the world. I think when I started in the public health field in the 1970s, we would probably have said it had the safest food supply in the world. Uh, but at least today, I think we would qualify that a, a bit by saying, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have one of the safest food supplies in the world. But the challenges are there, and it's going to take a cooperative effort on the part of really both the regulatory community and the uh, industry in all segments to effectively uh, address some of the challenges that we're going to talk about this morning. So uh, my plan is to talk for about an hour and then leave about 20 minutes for questions and, and answers. If, however, both in the classroom and online, if you have any questions that might arise during the course of the presentation, feel free to ask and we'll try to address those at, at that particular time. All right, well today we're going to look at uh, several different things that I think probably are all somewhat interrelated to, you know, the issue of, of the food safety challenges in a global marketplace. I want to just briefly look at the incidence and impact of foodborne illness on uh, Americans. We're going to look at pathogens found in different kinds of foods, which is somewhat unique uh, uh, than we have seen maybe in the past. We're going to look at changing demographics, the fact that our population is changing in a lot of different ways, and in some cases uh, these changes are making it more vulnerable to certain kinds of foodborne diseases. We'll also look at a, briefly at some of the changing consumption patterns and the impact that that can have. Uh, on their health related to food safety kinds of issues. We'll look at the global food supply. Uh, you know, it goes without saying that a vast majority of our food, in, and particularly in certain categories, comes from outside the United States and frequently from countries that don't necessarily have the same levels of sanitation that we have uh, here in the U.S. We're going to look at the potential for threat of intentional contamination of food. Food defense is something that really has sort of arisen since 9-11. We used to always think of food safety issues as being unintentional or accidental, and certainly most of them are. But now we, because of the uh, threat of terrorism and bioterrorism and agroterrorism in particular, we have to also think in terms of food defense as well as just uh, traditional food safety. Look quickly at changing production practices. In some cases, just how we produce food. Uh, may be contributing to some of the food safety challenges that we experience. And then last but not least, what is being done primarily within the regulatory community to try to ensure food safety from farm to table. So we have a lot of things that I'd like to, to talk about just briefly this morning, and certainly we could spend a lot more than just an hour on these issues, but uh, hopefully this will at least give you uh, some sense of the sort of where we are in terms of food safety uh, in America. Well, in terms of the incidence and impact of foodborne illness, these data were released by uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, earlier this year. They indicated that according to their sort of best estimates, we have roughly now 48 million cases of foodborne illness in the U.S. Uh, annually. These result in, in the uh, approximately 128,000 hospitalizations and 3,000 deaths. Now, it's sort of a case of the good news and the bad news. Similar data were released in 1999, and those indicated we had 76 million cases of foodborne illness, uh, oh, about 300,000 hospitalizations and 5,000 deaths. So if you look at it from one perspective, you can say, well, instead of you know one out of four Americans being affected annually with a foodborne illness, now the number's at one in six. So we, I think it shows we are making progress. But we also should look at it from the perspective that all foodborne illness is preventable. And just by reducing food, the incidence of foodborne illness by 10%, we would eliminate 5,000 cases of disease in this country every year. So, you know, you kind of look at it as a glass half empty or as a glass half full, um, but it is what it is. Also, in terms of cost, 
it is estimated that we spend about $152 billion a year uh, in costs associated with foodborne illness. And these can be in the form of just simply medical expenses for people who are suffering from those diseases, lost productivity because they can't work because they're ill, loss of business in some cases to companies and groups that are linked to these illnesses. Lawsuits certainly are a common uh, element of, of a foodborne outbreak and then certainly loss of reputation. And in some cases, that loss of reputation not only impacts the business that's directly involved with the foodborne disease outbreak, but any business that sells similar kinds of products. And we'll talk about that just uh, in a moment. The point I think that really should be significant to all of us is that the amount of funding that the federal government spends to assure food safety is roughly 10% of this $152 billion figure. So, you know, if you look at it, it might well be money spent that would provide a greater return on the investment if we would spend more money, both in terms of the public sector and the private sectors, and focus on the prevention of foodborne illness than it would be on these costs that are associated with the outcomes that occur as a result of, of foodborne illness. There are about 250 different types of foodborne illnesses that have been described to date. Uh, as you, I'm sure, are aware, most of these are associated with biological hazards, things like bacteria and viruses and, and parasites. There are some that are related to chemical hazards, such as, you know, could be toxins from, from microbial organisms or, or synthetic chemicals or even, you know, toxins associated with certain kinds of seafood and, and other products. Uh, but, you know, the, the listing that I provided here, I think, is unique in that these are simply the pathogens that we have identified since the mid-1970s. So essentially, you know, in the last 45 years or so, we're seeing all of these pathogens that prior to the 1970s, and I, I kind of date myself because that's about the time that I started getting involved in public health. These are all pathogens that when I entered the field, we didn't know about. The bottom line is there's lots more like these that we still don't know anything about, and, and we'll talk about that in, in a moment. But to say that we really know uh, a lot about food safety may be probably an overstatement. I think what we really should say is we have a lot to learn about food safety, and our tools are getting better, our investigative processes are getting better, our reporting processes are getting better, our laboratory analyses are getting better. So the good news is I think we will learn more, but in some cases, we, as we begin to learn more, it may uh, somewhat cause our consuming public to be a little bit more alarmed about what we find out. And those are part of the challenges that we face. Well, as you're probably aware, foodborne illness generally falls into three categories. Quickly, as a review, we have infections, we have intoxications, and we have toxin-mediated infections. A person will experience an infection generally when they eat a food that's contaminated with living microorganisms. So <clears throat> maybe a bacteria, maybe a virus, but generally they consume the food, it's contaminated with these living pathogens. Once those pathogens get in their, their body and generally uh, get as far as the large intestine, then they sort of begin to grow, they multiply, and they produce symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea, fever, the things that generally would be associated with any kind of an infection. And in some cases, one of the reasons why the symptoms are very much like other kinds of diseases, and people oftentimes misdiagnose themselves, or in some cases even their physicians can misdiagnose them because of the fact that the symptoms of foodborne illness you know, do mimic symptoms associated with other types of, of infections uh, as well. Intoxications occur when someone consumes a chemical in the food. Now, that could be a synthetic chemical, such as we talked about, like a pesticide or a disinfectant or a sanitizer or some other type of, of chemical agent, or it could be a toxin that is produced as a waste product um, by the bacteria. And a good example would be Staph aureus, which produces a toxin as part of its waste products. If you happen to consume the, the uh, toxin, then generally it produces uh, that, the, the symptoms of what we call a chemical intoxication. Generally, the way we can tell the difference is that with an intoxication, the body generally responds by wanting to evacuate the material, so the person generally vomits. 
Uh, whereas with an infection, the body still is trying to get rid of the material, but it's generally maybe through vomiting, diarrhea, uh, and so forth. Bottom line is, with an intoxication, usually the response is, is more immediate. So in, in most cases, it could be as quickly as, as 15 to 30 minutes in the case of a chemical, or in the case of a biological toxin, it could be somewhere in the range of two to four hours. With a toxin-mediated infection, the person eats a bacteria that is living, but once it gets inside of the body, then the bacteria produces waste, and it's actually the waste that result in the illness. So it's sort of a hybrid of the first two, that you have to sort of meet the, the conditions of an infection by consuming living microbes, but it's a chemical or toxin that, that literally produces the disease, and therefore, uh, it, it is really an intoxication. So that's why we call it uh, a toxin-mediated infection, or in, sometimes you'll see this referred to as a toxico infection. But, you know, the bottom line is people will have different diseases based upon the kinds of pathogens that they're exposed to. All right, well, to look at, at a few cases that we've seen in the news recently, um, I'm going to focus more on large outbreaks. These are generally ones that involve either more people uh, as victims or they involve multi-state kinds of outbreaks. The one that you've probably been reading about and certainly uh, have probably seen in the media in the last few months is the outbreak of Listeria monocytogenes that was linked to uh, the cantaloupe that were produced by a, a grower in, in Colorado. Um, there were 146 cases in 28 states, uh, including Indiana. There were 30 deaths. Again, Listeria monocytogenes has about a 20% case fatality rate. So, you know, people who contract Listeria, and it's very significant when it comes to children uh, and particularly unborn uh, children, and one miscarriage was associated. Now, that's all that were reported. There may well have been others. Uh, but at least in terms of the CDC investigation, these were the numbers that were uh, specifically linked to this one outbreak. The one feature that I think is very significant about listeria, and one that obviously is a challenge to food safety, is the fact that listeria monocytogenes bacteria are able to grow even at refrigeration temperatures. Historically, we use refrigeration as a means of, of really safely storing foods, um, because bacteria generally either don't grow or grow at very, very slow rates when they are in a refrigerated environment. That's not the case with Listeria. It's capable of growing fairly quickly even at temperatures down below 38 degrees. And while much of our commercial refrigeration that we see in restaurants and supermarkets and so forth will be able to hold foods at that temperature, most residential refrigerators will not. And so, you know, if your consumer's refrigerators are working at 41 to 45, you know, that's really in the, in the temperature danger zone as far as, as these bacteria in particular uh, are concerned. We saw la earlier last year uh, an outbreak that involved not only the United States and, and uh, Canada, but also involved 16 different countries in Europe. Uh, and it was associated with an E. coli outbreak associated with sprouts. And there's a couple of things that's unique about uh, this. One is, this is sort of an unusual species of E. coli. Normally, when we think of E. coli outbreaks in this country, we think of shigatoxin producing E. coli, and normally 015787 is the serotype that generally we would uh, see most commonly. This, as you can see, is a virocytotoxin producing E. coli 0104H4. Uh, it was linked to bean sprouts, and again, I think to show the, sort of the global nature of this, the bean sprouts came from Egypt, or that's where the, the seeds themselves were produced. They were, the sprouts were, the, were produced in Germany, and they were distributed to, you know, 14 countries in Europe and the U.S. and Canada and the United States. Over 4,000 cases of illness, 50 deaths, were reported, and, and this was dated as of December of last year. This was at least the uh, World Health Organization sort of final report. May have been a few more, but that's kind of at the point where they thought the outbreak had run its course. 
with E. coli, whether shigatoxin or the virocytotoxin producing E. coli, our real concern is uh, a, an acute kidney disease called hemolytic uremic syndrome or HUS. Uh, generally is more likely to be a problem for young and, and elderly, but you know, it's a case where you know, that is the typical cause of death uh, associated with, with the uh, E. coli, whether it's shigatoxin or uh, the virocytotoxin producing uh, organisms. Uh, there were, in, in 2010, we had 2,000 illnesses caused by salmonella and eggs produced at simply two farms in the state of Iowa. As a result, not only did we see those, that large number of cases of the disease, but there were uh, literally a half billion eggs that were recalled uh, as a result of the outbreak. And so not only was the cost of the investigation significant, the cost of the recall to that particular uh, pair of farms was significant as well. In 2009, there were 26 people from eight states who were infected with E. coli 0157A7 in ground beef. That's not, in itself, is not unusual, but as a result, there again was nearly a half million pounds of ground beef recalled, uh, which again costs the company money and certainly costs local regulatory agencies resources in terms of making sure that the products are uh, effectively recalled. So, uh, it gets back to that point of, you know, how much are we spending to fix problems associated with foodborne illness when, in fact, maybe we're not spending nearly enough on sort of the front end uh, of that process to try to prevent these cases. Well, those are sort of pathogens and diseases that, you know, maybe we have sort of found to be traditionally common as far as foodborne illness. Another challenge we have is that there are pathogens, some of which we've known about, some of which are new, that now are being linked to different kinds of foods. In the past, salmonella, generally, we always associated with raw poultry and eggs. Now we're seeing it with ground beef, we're seeing it with, as a contaminant in peanut butter, we've seen it linked to foodborne outbreaks in alfalfa sprouts and even uh, jalapeno peppers a few years ago that were involved. The shigatoxin producing E. coli, as we said, generally we've always thought as being a problem with red meat. And again, really the first case of 015787 was the Jack in the Box incident um, that occurred in the early 1990s uh, associated with the improper, um, you know, cooking of the ground beef patties that were contaminated with the E. coli bacteria. But since We've seen it associated with spinach, with lettuce, with even raw cookie dough, um, cheeses, hazelnuts, and, and products that maybe were not really thought to be uh, uh, common as far as their association uh, as a vehicle with these kinds of pathogens. And then recently we've seen botulism and chili sauce, olives and things. We'll talk about just a couple of cases that uh, I think illustrate the, the challenges we have with sort of the traditional pathogens and emerging pathogens becoming linked to different kinds of food. There is an outbreak ongoing right now that involves Salmonella typhimurium. Again, when we looked at those five leading causes of foodborne illness, we, it was the non-typhoidal uh, types of Salmonella that were, were uh, indicated. This is actually one that involves uh, Salmonella typhimurium or a typhoidal version of the, of the bacteria. It's linked to eating ground beef that was purchased from Hannaford Supermarkets, which is a sort of a New England-based company. It has stores in, in Maine and in much of the New England states, but also there's been outbreaks in Hawaii and, and uh, uh, Kentucky. So it's not just uh, based. But so far, there's 19 people in seven states that have been uh, identified as suffering from uh, salmonella or salmonellosis based upon this particular uh, outbreak. The thing that I think is very significant about this outbreak though is that the strain of salmonella uh, that we're seeing with this one outbreak is considered to be a multi-drug resistant strain of bacteria, which basically says a lot of those antibiotics that we traditionally use to treat people with these kinds of infections aren't working with this particular uh, strain of bacteria. And my concern is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just the beginning. And in my opinion, that one of the biggest public health challenges we're going to face in the next probably 20 to, to 50 years 
is the growing number of antibiotic resistant pathogens. And what that generally means is that a lot of the drugs that we have used historically to treat people who have infections caused by these organisms will no longer work, which is not only, uh, as in the case of this one outbreak, we're probably involving uh, a higher level of hospitalization, but in some cases the, uh, the, the sort of success of, as far as the treatment of the people with these infections is not going to be as great. So far, there's been no deaths reported in this one outbreak, but as I said, it is ongoing, and we really don't know, uh, obviously, until we see the entire uh, sort of, of uh, course of the disease, exactly uh, the, what will be the, the final number of cases and whether any deaths might be associated with it. I also mentioned the threat of intentional contamination. You know, this has arisen since 9-11. Um, it's done for a for a variety of reasons. In some cases, it's done to generate fear, as is appropriate with most terrorist activities, but it's also done to impose economic hardship and, and to uh, affect the health and well-being of people. We know that generally, if you are intentionally contaminating a product, you probably are using a pathogens that are refined and have you know, higher levels and concentrations. In most cases, this is probably going to result in more rapid onset, and in some cases, more severe symptoms and outcomes of the disease. So, as I said, we really are saying food safety today really involving both food safety and uh, food defense. We also have seen cases where, in some instances, we're still dealing with adulteration kinds of conditions. One of the incidents that occurred relatively recently was in 2008, where we had, you know, uh, milk or infant formula in particular in China that was contaminated with melamine. Uh, there were 300,000 babies who became ill um, associated with kidney stones and kidney failure. They reported six deaths. We would have to think that that's probably a gross underreporting of the actual level. What they were doing is, in milk we sell by weight, not by volume. So what they were doing is these farms and milk processing plants essentially were, were diluting the milk with water. Then they were adding melamine because melamine mimics proteins and so they did that to so that the analysis that was done would look like that the uh, that the milk had a normal protein content uh, and basically was whole milk when in fact it, it was really uh, grossly diluted but you know they sort of tricked the uh, the laboratory test into producing sort of uh, uh, false positive kinds of results Agroterrorism also is of concern, obviously, to the uh, agricultural sector of this country. The ironic part of it is that, in some cases, the things that make our sort of American agro industry the, the success that it is, things like we produce it really quick, we transport it very fast, we get it to market very soon, we don't hold it very long, and people buy it and consume it right away, are also things that make it vulnerable to the effects of agroterrorism because once these products become contaminated, it's sometimes difficult to really stop them before uh, the products ha have been eaten. So whether or not it's an economic cost or a public health issue, uh, concern over you know intentional contamination in this country is is growing. Another thing that has created some concerns is simply how we are changing the way we produce foods. And this is particularly true with animal production. Animal agriculture in this country, as you can appreciate, has changed drastically in the last 50 years. The family farm that has, you know, a few uh, head up to maybe a few hundred head have largely been replaced by the mega farms. And, the, and uh, this is done not only in, in this country, uh, but throughout the world. And, and it not only creates opportunities for transfer of pathogens, but the distance also provides time for pathogens to reach levels that can, you know, threaten our, uh, the safety of our food. 90% of the hogs, 97% of the poultry that are produced in the United States are grown in what we call concentrated animal feeding operations. These are those places where generally the animal is held in a confined space, usually never really touches the natural environment. They don't graze. All the food's brought to them. Um, and so roughly 2% of all livestock uh, now uh, will, or those farms, raise 40% of the animals in this, uh, 
in this country. So we're dealing with things, and because of the stress associated with just confinement and the opportunities for the transfer of pathogens, we're seeing you know, more and more uh, of these sort of low-level diseases that are taking place. Well, the infectious diseases, as we said, can come because the animals are, are confined, they're stressed, they have sort of an atypical diet, there's a lot of different things, but also the diseases can be transmitted to humans. Um, and it could be as far as the people who work in, the, in these livestock production facilities, but it can also occur during transport. It could be associated with, you know, the mishandling of manure, even veterinary medicine, and, and in some cases meat processing facilities uh, can be involved. So in order to try to counteract this, it has become common practice to use what we call subtherapeutic applications of antibiotics for these kinds of animals. The problem is that because we're dealing with basically low doses over essentially the lifetime of the animal uh, and healthy animals, we're seeing that the the uh, antibiotics will not kill all of the bacteria. So those that survive are mutating and are passing along genes that make them more resistant to these kinds of antibiotics. And in many instances, these are the same antibiotics, as I mentioned, that we historically have used to treat uh, infections uh, in humans. This number, um, the 70% the of all antibiotics sold in the U.S. are given to healthy food animals on industrial farms. I've actually seen uh, as high as 80 to 90%. Because there's really no record keeping, uh, the, that, that figure is a little bit fuzzy. But we know that obviously there are challenges associated with it. And again, same kinds of things. So we're talking about things like penicillins and the, and the tetracyclines and the sulfonamides and others. These are the things. And, and we have not seen the development of new uh, antimicrobials and antibiotics in this country by the pharmaceutical industry to keep pace. So the, the concern we really have is that these bacteria are mutating faster than we're coming up with new drugs. And so now we have antibiotic resistant pathogens or in the case of the salmonella that we talked about that's associated with the ongoing outbreak in ground beef, it's a multi-drug. So there's more than one of these that the organism is considered to be resistant to. Uh, and there's no indication that the pharmaceutical industries are going to change this anytime soon because they maintain that the return on the investment for developing these new kinds of antimicrobials is just not as great as coming up with a Prozac or, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, erectile dysfunction drug or whatever that, you know, they can sell for lots of money and, uh, and, and have a large market. So this is a concern, I think, that, that public health has or should have and will continue to be a problem for the future. Well, so what do we do? Well, I would argue that we really need to implement interventions in food safety from the farm to the table. So whether it comes from, you know, uh, the, the farm, whether it's, it's and that farm is in the United States or, or halfway across the world, through processing, through retail, and, and certainly even consumers. Federal oversight of food safety generally involves uh, a group of organizations and laws. One of the common criticisms of our, uh, at least efforts at the federal level, is that there's too much fragmentation uh, in terms of, food safety oversight, and there are too many agencies, and sometimes they have conflicting rules uh, and regulations. For most uh, of the food supply, the two agencies really that have the greatest uh, effect as far as food safety regulation are USDA and FDA. As I said before, USDA is essentially responsible for regulating meat, poultry, and eggs. The one challenge that, that we have, or I don't know if you call it a challenge, but a reality that creates some concern, I think, for uh, some people, uh, is that USDA has actually a dual mission. One is to enhance and protect the safety of our food supply, but the other is to promote American agribusiness. And I think historically people are under the impression that they spend more time promoting American agribusiness than they do assuring the safety of our food supply. But divisions or agencies within USDA, including things like the uh, Agricultural Marketing Service and the Food Safety Inspection Service 
are involved in you know regulating the safety and grading of our foods and and things like that um, a lot of, of the plants that produce large quantities of our uh, meat poultry and eggs are inspected on a daily basis by uh, representatives of USDA or maybe state level uh, personnel that are working under contract uh, for uh, USDA but the challenge is a lot of the things that we've talked about already don't necessarily manifest themselves in visible defects uh, for the product. So it's it, without a, a really extensive laboratory testing program, but again, that sort of runs contra contrary to how we do business in American agriculture, because we want to get it from the farm to the consumer as quickly as possible. They don't want to have to warehouse it for even 72 hours while we're doing some microbial testing. Uh, of that particular lot to make sure that it's safe. Those are, those are challenges that we face. FDA has, as I said, jurisdiction over about 80% of our food supply. It's essentially everything but, you know, the meat, poultry, and eggs. But it's all of the seafood, all of the dairy, all of the produce. Anything that's basically canned uh, would be under the auspices of FDA. And this includes both domestic and uh, imported products. But the agency itself is not particularly large. They only have about 900 investigators and 450 analysts. So, you know, they're really sort of designed to be a support service. And they do uh, work with state and local agencies, but that's, uh, you know, still part of the challenge that we have is just making sure we have the resources available. One of the things that really I think is, has the potential at least for causing a major sort of what I would consider enhancement of food safety in this country was the enactment of the Food Safety Modernization Act in 2010. This literally was the first time since the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938 that we have made a major overhaul. Uh, and, you know, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 38 was sort of a major overhaul of the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. So, you know, it, it, it took us about twice as long to get to the third iteration than it did from the very first to the second iteration of our food safety uh, laws in this country. The, the beauty of the Food Safety Modernization Act is that it provides some tools, it provides some resources, and the focus is for FDA to emphasize prevention as opposed to response. Uh, and, and this is obviously uh, significant. The way that FDA is to operate under, and I'm going to use the acronym FASMA, the federal government does not like the term FASMA, but it's easier than, than saying the Food Safety Modernization Act. It puts prevention up front, as we said, but it also requires FDA to create science-based standards for the safe production and harvesting of fruits and vegetables. This is the first time we've actually seen now uh, laws somewhat parallel to what we've done with meat, poultry, dairy, seafood, and, and other things that historically we've viewed as being, you know, important vehicles of foodborne illness. Now this, this produce is going to be addressed. Food facilities not only produce, but in all of those areas that uh, FDA regulates will now be required to put in place written prevention control plans. For those of us that have been in food safety for a number of years, we would think of these as HACCP plans, but the, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act does not refer to HACCP, but essentially these prevention control plants are HACCP in nature. They require sort of uh, anticipation of uh, potential problem areas. They require routine monitoring. They also require, you know, specifying what control measures are taken when uh, either a critical control point or a critical limit is not satisfied. So essentially it's HACCP without using the, the term HACCP. FDA also for the first time has the authority to recall foods. In the past, they could not mandate a recall with the exception of infant formula that was contaminated. Now they can, which is uh, believed to be in some cases uh, a significant element uh, of FASMA. And also FDA can administratively detain food when there's reason to believe that it's been adulterated or misbranded. So as we said, when a lot of these foods are coming in to our port cities throughout the country, if there's reason to believe there may be problems with adulteration or misbranding, they can require them to be held there until they can be properly tested uh, and determine whether or not they are 
uh, safe to eat. There is a significant emphasis under FASMA on imported foods. It involves things like importer accountability so that the companies that are importing from outside or even the vendors who are using imported foods, they have to make sure that those companies that they're working with that are based outside the United States have basically the same rules and regulations in place and processes for food safety that we would require for domestic firms. There's a significant emphasis on third-party certification, both of foods and of facilities. There, the question becomes what, what sort of criteria and guidelines are we going to be using? And there are groups like the Global Food Safety Initiative and others that are working to sort of resolve that to where we hopefully someday will come up with a global standard for food safety that we would use then as the basis for these certification processes. Um, there will be, you know, additional resources that are in, will be invested. FDA is in the process of setting up some regional uh, offices throughout the world. They have one in China, they've got one in India, they have one in South America. And though the agency doesn't have jurisdiction, it's a consulting group. And basically it says, if you want to sell products to the United States, you know, these are the rules you're going to have to follow and we're here to help you to do that. And they work with both the regulatory agencies in, uh, and governments in those countries as well as the, uh, the, the groups in the uh, private sector. They, and as we said, they also have the authority to refuse entry of these products. And, and that really is, you know, now we have sort of a, uh, a stop point or a checkpoint to assure that these products are not getting into our distribution system without being uh, fairly uh, comfortable that they're, they're safe to eat. There are challenges, though, even with FASMA, because it's estimated that FDA is going to need about $5 billion uh, to effectively implement uh, FASMA. The fiscal year budget for last year and, and into this year only provided 1.37 billion. The, what we have at this point is FDA moving forward with developing all of the plans and all of the sort of the processes and protocols to implement the various provisions of FASMA, but we haven't seen anything actually being implemented yet. The other challenge we have is that as we said, FDA has a fairly limited number of staff and resources. Those are going to be pretty much used to regulate those imported products that we are seeing coming in from outside the United States. That means that the responsibility for the oversight of all domestic products will be shift to state and in some cases local government. There's some question about whether or not the state and local agencies have the wherewithal to pick up those. Even, even if they have, you know, if FDA or the, the federal government through FASMA provides some funding, you know, the question becomes, are they going to be properly prepared? Can they do inspections of these kinds of uh, processing plants if they're not, you know, sort of accustomed uh, to doing that? And that becomes uh, a concern. But in general, FDA is going to kind of develop a priority system. They're going to focus on you know, those products and processes that uh, are either that considered to be the highest risk, either they're, they're most vulnerable to contamination, or are the things that we know historically have been uh, most commonly linked to foodborne disease outbreaks. And we'll, so it may be that implementation is going to be sort of in a phased in and piecemeal uh, approach, if you will, at least in the short term. The other question becomes, you know, and I think that this is pretty much a bipartisan supported issue, but the issue really gets down to money. And depending on who's, you know, elected, particularly next November, and what the effects are in terms of the downsizing of, of the role of the federal government in particular, who knows whether the funds will be cut off and will keep us from, you know, really uh, having the resources needed to fully implement the provisions of, of FASMA. Even though uh, both sides of the aisle said, we know this is an, a priority and it needs to be done, you know, you can't do it unless the agencies are given the resources to do it with. In summary, we do have one of the safest food supplies in the world, but hopefully you can appreciate that foodborne illness does have a significant impact on public health uh, in our country. The world is changing and so are the challenges that we find associated with ensuring food safety and certainly 
uh, I think to be effective, the interventions that we have to address these food safety challenges have to come at all points along the flow of food from the farm to the table and have to involve not only the regulatory community, but also the industry and even consumer uh, groups as well. And if we can do that, uh, I think we will be able to try to, you know, hopefully make uh, our food safety system once again the safest in the world. And that should be the goal that, that we're working for.